So hello everyone, um, it is a pleasure for me to introduce you to the work that was recently published. Um, the title of the article is The Structure and the Function of the Global Ocean Microbiome. And um, of course, I would like to start uh, I th with a slide that I thought was the most difficult one, is uh, to really thank all the people who were involved in this project that made this uh, fantastic um, yeah, almost a fairy tale possible, uh, but um, it's not anymore the most difficult slide because uh, previous speakers have mentioned many of the collaborators, the institutions, the sponsors um, that have uh, made all this uh, project possible. So I can um, just um, move on and just mention a few ones that I would like to particularly highlight. Uh, for example, the Pangea database has been instrumental in collecting all the environmental metadata, putting barcodes on the samples, and really data alone um, are worthless if you don't put them into the context of uh, the environment. Um, the EBI has been instrumental, and as I think it was Eric who mentioned, um, they might have been shocked by the amount of data that we were going to deposit. And they actually, I was in close contact with the people who made this possible. It's a, it's a new way of depositing data. We submitted data that they didn't see before, so they had to work on their backbone to make it possible to make this data actually um, available to the public and to link this information with the Pangea database so that together now the genomic and the environmental data can be downloaded and analyzed together. So I think uh, this is, uh, has been a great additional work um, which will be very much appreciated, I think, by, by the community. And then also, um, this is something that people usually don't see behind um, what's written in text. Um, the, the, the analysis of this huge amount of data that were collected just for what we've done in this paper required more than 50 million CPU hours. Um, this just means if you have a regular desktop computer, it would have calculated for 50 million hours until you would get um, the, the, the initial crunching of the analysis and then um, the statistical analysis are, are less computationally intensive. Um, but one thing that is, was really key in, in getting it done, it is a relatively short time frame, I think, from when we um, plan to, to uh, publish the results to when it actually happened. Uh, a year is actually not that much time. And I would really like to thank uh, the Scientific Advisory Board who really pushed us to wrap up the data and make it available to the public because we could have analyzed the data forever. And as other people have said, um, it will be a resource for people to, to analyze the data for the next 10 years. We didn't want to wait this much. And uh, as I said, the SAB was really instrumental in pushing us to, to get um, the, the wrap-up done. And then uh, one, one last thing um, I would like to say, a personal thank is to Stephanie Kandels lewis because uh, I think sometimes she's underappreciated, um, but getting... <laughs> But getting 35,000 samples from all over the world to its destination place, not losing a single sample, not losing a single barcode, so that all data that were collected are still available, is, I think, to great part uh, owing to, to her um, work. And in addition, she also organized the conferences and all the meetings uh, that were really needed to put this heterogeneous uh, amount of people together to, to do the work that we did. So. With that, uh, I'd like to start to <clears throat> with the presentation of the paper. Um, we looked at it uh, as something we tried to, to push ocean ecosystems biology. What I mean by that is you look at the ecosystem ocean and try to do systems biology on it. Systems biology is a, is a vague word that can have many definitions, but uh, if you look at the left side, this is more or less what a computational biologist would think of uh, ecosystems biology. So you have the boat, in this case, uh, sailing around the world collecting data, collecting data, collecting data. They end up in a computer. Uh, you, you collected a large amount of data and you're trying to make sense out of it. So you try to recognize patterns in this huge amount of data. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a data-driven approach. It's a little bit like being a naturalist sailing around the world and describing animals, just that we do this with data. Um, so in this, end, in this case uh, of, of our work, uh, we had data from 68 stations from all over the world from all major oceanic regions. We collected samples at three different depth layers. In total, we had 243 samples that we analyzed. Uh, we generated 7.2 terabase pairs of DNA data. Just to put this in context, it's the, the EBI confirmed it's the largest systematically collected metagenomic data set that exists so far. Um, it has collected more data than the human gut microbiome, which is work that we are also involved in. So this is quite a remarkable amount of data. Uh, what we did with the data is um, metagenomics. So what you can, you, you could imagine metagenomics to be, you, you take all the organisms, you extract all the DNA, and you chop it down into millions and billions of pieces, and then you have the, 
great um, challenge to put all the pieces back together. Um, so first you reconstruct the genomes uh, of, of origins, and then once you reconstructed uh, these genomes, uh, you, you predict what kind of genes you find on those uh, genomes. And what we did was uh, to establish an ocean microbial reference gene catalog. This is what we call. So we, we used all genes that were predicted in all the, the Terra samples uh, from this data set and merged it together with currently existing information from the ocean environment. So we, we merged all meta, large metagenomic and ocean um, microbi, microbial genome data and put them all together and generated a non-redundant catalog that people can now use uh, as a genetic inventory of the ocean, pretty much. What we found was a, a staggering number of 40 million uh, different kinds of genes. Um, when you compare it uh, to the human gut microbiome, you had uh, an order of magnitude more samples. Um, from, but um, the, the genetic diversity was four times less. It's hard to directly compare these numbers, but this, this tells us something uh, about a uh, general trend that the ocean uh, has a much larger genetic diversity than the, the human gut. Um, for uh, the, in terms of how much did we actually see and how much uh, is there still to come, so what we can say is that for at least the sampling areas uh, that we visited, uh, we have a pretty good coverage of uh, the genetic material. Um, but um, so in terms of what is new, what was known before, this is uh, shown in, in this figure. Um, it's divided by different ocean regions and just focus on, on perhaps the, the mean. So from top to bottom you go from surface to the, the deep chlorophyll maximum layer to the mesopelagic, uh, so from top to bottom. And what you can get from this figure is that uh, in the surface area, more or less half of the genes had already been sampled, in, for example, by the um, the, the Global Ocean Survey Expedition uh, surely uh, made a great contribution to this. But the deeper you go, you see that there's lot more and more unknown genes. So in the mesopelagic, where the, the average sequencing, uh, sampling depth was about 600 meters, you see that 80 to 90 percent of the genes were actually novel. So it means Terra has sampled and, and, and assembled them for the first time. Um, and still, to put this into an even larger context, we have to keep in mind that uh, Terra Ocean sampled the photic zone and the mesopelagic zone, which you see as the gray and the, uh, and the green and the, the blue bands uh, at the top. But considering that the ocean average depth is actually 4,000 meters, this tells us just that we are at the beginning of, of uh, capturing the, the full genetic diversity of the whole ocean. But nevertheless, uh, you have to first things first. Uh, we, we sampled uh, down to about 1,000 meters, and now we were interested in uh, having these data. How are the ocean microbial communities structured, and um, what are the driving factors of these communities? These were two of the main questions that we were aiming um, to answer. And um, so what, what we did was we, we took the microbial composition of each sample, and then we, we wanted to take a, a broad a bird's eye view onto the data and ask how do they separate? Are there any, is there anything? Um, that, that can be seen just by the naked eye. And uh, if you look at the, the left figure, you see that there's a separation of samples that are encoded as circles or, or squares, uh, which are the, the surface or the, the DCM um, samples. That means that there's, it's water w which is still penetrated by light. And then the, the triangles are those that originate from the mesopelagic. So the depth is, uh, seems to be the main stratifier of ocean microbial communities. Communities that, are in the, that live in the deep are very different than um, those in, in, the, in the sunlit area. Um, we measured other ecological parameters and um, found that globally, if, if, you, if you put, if you make, want to make global statements that the communities in the mesopelagic are richer, so you find more species um, down there. Um, the density of the number of cells that you find per volume is lower in the, um, in the mesopelagic and um, the organisms that live in the mesopelagic also seem to replicate uh, at lower um, rates. So the slow growers at less density, but more diverse uh, communities in the mesopelagic. Next, um, we were asking, what are the driving factors? What are the environmental variables? We collected so many of them, so would we find patterns that would explain how microbial communities um, are, are structured? And um, we, we, we did the same. Um, coloring each uh, sample by ocean region. Um, and what you can see here is that they don't necessarily cluster by region. So you could 
expect that the, the, the closer um, the, the sampling stations are, the more similar the communities would look, but actually this is not so much the case, otherwise you would have clusters of the same color. Uh, we plotted uh, um, instead um, an environmental variable that we suspected to play a big role, which is temperature, and you can see that um, the, the distribution or the, the separation of those samples actually is pretty well explained by temperature. But then we ask the question, is temperature actually the, the main driving factors or are other environmental variables that could explain it better? Uh, what we did here is um, it's called a, a partial mantle test, so you have to correct for the proximity of the samples. Um, so it's a geographic distance corrected correlation of environmental parameters with uh, microbial community composition. And indeed, we found temperature to be among the, the strongest factors, but you can see that oxygen is almost as high. We used a, a statistical technique. Um, it's, it's a machine learning technique, and I can talk about the details over coffee break or lunch or whenever. Um, but um, we, we were able to disentangle the effect of temperature and oxygen and found, um, and which is really nice. It matches the, the results that, found, that were found for the viral communities, that temperature is by far the, the strongest um, driver of the surface um, open ocean communities. Um, other factors like nutrients and light uh, were rather weakly correlated um, as, a, as, as another result of, of this analysis. Um, how strongly, and, and, and to, find, to, quant to find some quantitative measure, how closely or how much linked are temperature and the microbial community composition, uh, we try to predict the temperature. So we take different microbial community compositions and just try to to predict what was the temperature of uh, the where the sample was collected. And you can see that this model uh, explains 86% of the variation. So in other words, you can predict the temperature reasonably well, just depending on, on looking at what kind of microbial organisms you find in the sample. Um, so the ocean is one ecosystem, but if we want to look beyond the ocean, um, we were interested in comparing the data from the ocean ecosystem with another ecosystem, and we were looking for data that could uh, be used to compare what we find in the ocean uh, with, and the only thing, the only other environment that we found was the, the human gut microbiome, and uh, we happened to work in this area too, so it was good to, for us and, and that we could um, compare these data. What we did here was asking the question, what are the genetic functions that you have to have in any um, microbial community or in any sample in the ocean. Um, so to do that, you would have, you need a, a large number of samples and ask the question, do I see this function in this sample? What we did in the end um, is when you see a function everywhere, a ubiquitous function, we call it the core function. So this is, these are functions that are found in every microbial community in, in, um, in the ecosystem and then what you can see here when you try to functionally characterize these core functions, the left one shows the human gut, in which more than 90% of the functions are actually characterized known, so you know what the genes do. In the ocean, it's only 60%, which tells us that in the ocean, there's a lot of gene families of which the functions are actually still unknown. So this is also a, a good target to, for future research um, to understand what uh, functions, or what, what are actually these functions of these um, still uncharacterized genes. Um, then, um, again, if you, if, you, if you go beyond the ocean and try to understand how microbial communities work or what are the patterns that you find in, in communities across ecosystems, here you see in, at the top, it's, the, it's again the samples, and this is the phylogenetic composition, and you see that it, by phylogenetic, um, the phylogenetic composition of the samples is actually very variable across uh, the samples, while the functional composition is pretty much uh, constant. So wherever you go in the ocean, the functions that are encoded by the microorganisms are the same, they're just encoded by different um, species. So it's, it's functionally redundant, but the information that they carry is very stable. This is not new, this is uh, not a result that we were not the first ones to find this. We also observed this in the human gut, so you have stable functions. Um, but um, it tells us that if you look at the functions that are not um, core, which you that you find everywhere, but at the minor fraction, of the, of the functions that are not everywhere. This, this is what I, probably the, the, the treasure box that um, you want to look into to understand what are the specific functions that make an environment or a site so uh, unique. But uh, back to, to the comparison between the ocean and the, and the human gut. Um, 
this was a rather surprising result because we simply asked the question, if you have two environments so different as the open ocean, it, it's oxygenated, it has light, um, there's lots of current and temperature ranges versus the human gut, it's anoxic, the temperature is very stable, we would, ex we would have expected um, not so much similarity between the functions between these two different ecosystems, but it turns out that about two-thirds or up to three-quarters of the, the gene copy numbers between these uh, different environments are actually shared. They are the same functions that are encoded um, of, of communities that live in these uh, very different environments. Um, and as, uh, as something that, um, an analysis of what functions you would find more enriched in the gut, you find a lot of defense um, genes, uh, genes that are involved in signal transduction and of course carbohydrate metabolism, uh, while in the ocean you find a lot of uh, genes that are uh, involved in, in transport mechanisms in general and of course to energy production. So this is, uh, this is more of a positive control, so these are things that are expected, but using these um, Tech, this analysis and looking at the results um, can be used to look into more specifically uh, what makes a gut microbe a gut microbe and what makes an ocean microbe an, an ocean microbe. Um, I'm almost at the end, but um, I just want to say that one of the, the goals of this work was making really the data available to the community. Um, as I said, we could have worked on those data forever, and, uh, but we, we wanted to make sure that Tara Oceans Consortium is, is a big team but it's a very, very small team compared to the community and all the brain and, and manpower and the potential that the community has to find many more um, interesting results and, and, um, and look at the data from many different angles that we probably cannot even think about. So um, the, that is a website that uh, provides all these resources um, and the links to the public databases where the data is stored. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>